Um, I'm Erin Calipari. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Pharmacology. And my lab focuses on understanding how the brain encodes information and how this is dysregulated in drug addiction. Um, so my lab really focuses on integrating um, complex behavioral models with cutting edge imaging techniques to be able to record from different cells and circuits in the brain in awake and behaving animals as they're making decisions um, in, in an environment. And so we use a lot of procedures where we actually allow animals to press a lever to get drugs so we can model the volitional process of drug consumption. And so, you know, in addiction, people are making choices to take drug either in a specific environment or at the expense of other, other rewards. And so we have models where we can give animals choices to take drug or not, and then we can look in the brain with things like calcium imaging to see what cells in the brain are actually driving their decision to take drug. Um, and then we use a lot of optical tools to be able to turn these cells and circuits on and off to try to change their behavior in real time. And so the goal is to understand which cells in the brain are actually controlling the motivation to take drug and then be able to silence them or activate these neurons to kind of change the way that animals are behaving in their environment. And so if we can figure out how we can manipulate these cell types, then we can go in with a lot of molecular tools that we use to understand how molecular targets within these cells are dysregulated to drive behavior and then try to target those pharmacologically for treatment. So I actually started here because I was fascinated about receptor signaling. So how things bind to receptors and that transmits a neurochemical signal from the outside of a cell inside. And so I started kind of from that angle of understanding how cells encode information. And then I ended up in a drug addiction lab in, in my undergraduate uh, training. And I got really excited about drugs of abuse because they essentially do the same thing. They take si signals and circuits in the brain that are activated and they bind to these receptors and transporters and they hijack the way that they function. And so drugs were exciting to me because we know how they're acting and then we can see how those signaling cascades within the cell change the way cells function. Um, and so once I started studying addiction, I started to realize how important of a question this really was. Um, especially in the state of Tennessee, where you have more opiate prescriptions per person. You can then go in and say, okay, well, this is obviously a major public health concern. And so not only do I get to look at the basic mechanisms of how the brain works and how organisms make decisions, I can do this in the context of something that's actually really, really critical for public health. My work integrates both basic and translational work. And so the big context of our work is saying, you know, how is the brain dysregulated by disease? But because of how we kind of conduct our studies, most of what we're doing is really basic science. We're giving animals information about their environment and saying, how do you use this information to make a decision? And so, you know, on a basic level, our question is, how does the brain work? How does the brain guide decision-making given environmental information? How do molecular targets within cells change the way animals make decisions? And so really what we're doing is basic science. And then we just take the next step to say, okay, well, now that we've identified how this works, how is this dysregulated in disease? And can we now collaborate with people at Vanderbilt to try to bring these kind of basic science findings into a translationally relevant environment? So our work is highly dependent on funding. And so, so one of the things that's really nice is that you know, the more funding you can get, the more risks you can take to really make these discoveries. And so when you have, have funding, you can say, OK, let's try that thing that may or may not work. But if it did, it would change the face of how we think about the brain. And so funding is critical to what we're doing. Um, we get our funding from the NIH, um, but we also get our funding through a lot of private foundations. And so the foundation is funding is very nice because it shows support for these diseases we're studying. Um, but one thing about addiction is it's vastly underfunded. And so a lot of the foundation awards are focused on other psychiatric diseases, but addiction really, even though it's one of the biggest public health problems, has a, a real lack of funding from these kind of private foundations. And so things that we try to do is, is find people who are passionate about our work that are willing to actually invest in us and help us kind of, you know, push science forward that could help solve this problem that has, has really, we've made progress, but we're not there yet. Private funding is really important because 
it is a little bit less restrictive. And so what this lets us do is really, you know, maybe look at the problem from a different angle. And so from the NIH, they have ways that they want to look at these problems. They have ways that they want to approach these problems. There's a consensus about what the problem that is important is. With the foundation, maybe you have some out there idea that would change the way we think about addiction as a disease. And those are a little bit harder to get funded from the NIH, but from a foundation, it gives you this leeway to really take risks and try to push the boundaries of how we understand psychiatric disease. And so it's, it's both the NIH and foundations are really critical to my work because they fund different kinds of research. And together, those are the things that make really big breakthroughs that then you push into models that maybe are more um, relevant to disease. Yeah. The, the NIH is great, but it's very structured. Yeah. And then the private funding is more like, we believe in you. Yeah. Here is some money for you to just figure out what you think is important. And those are where breakthroughs can be made because there's, they're, they're saying, you do what you do, and we believe in you. And now you can kind of apply this money to anything you think is important. And that's, that kind of freedom is, is really important for making breakthroughs on things that maybe we didn't expect, rather than saying, we have a hypothesis. Here's our, our hypothesis. This is how we're going to test it. That's, that's actually a critical component. But the first component maybe will be saying, we don't have a hypothesis yet, but let us get this big data that's going to let us computationally analyze it and figure out what we think is important. And it may identify a new target that you couldn't identify with NIH funding. But then that new target, you take it to the NIH and say, we have this target. Here's the data to back it up. Now let us get the money to really refine exactly how we're going to approach using this as a treatment. And so they're really complementary, and they're both really critical to scientific discovery. Vanderbilt is a, a really amazing institution. And so, you know, being a basic scientist that does addiction work, I was looking for a, a really good supportive community of people that would help me move, you know, my science forward, which is definitely here. Um, being somebody who does work in the context of addiction, I was looking for an, an institution that really valued the work that I was doing. And I'm part of the Vanderbilt Center for Addiction Research. And so Vanderbilt showed that it has a commitment to the kind of work that I am trying to do. Um, and then the other thing that was really, really kind of critical is that there's a huge patient population here. And so having access to people with the actual psychiatric diseases that I study is really critical for me in formulating how we're going to approach this problem. Because you need to actually have contact with people who have these diseases to ask them, what is the problem? What, what are you struggling with? What, how can we help you? And then once you know what these issues are, now you can go back into these basic models and say, OK, well, maybe relapse is the biggest issue. How do we model that in an animal? How can we figure out the mechanisms of this? How can we collaborate with other people at the institution to push this forward? And then the last thing that Vanderbilt has is they have a commitment to actually pushing molecular targets through to clinical trials in a research setting, which is really not available anywhere else in the world. I think the biggest thing for my career was making decisions about the people and not necessarily the research. And so one of the biggest things about science that I think is kind of this misconception is that, you know, science is done by scientists, but really, you know, it's a collaborative effort. And so what you want to find is a place where you feel that people are going to support your ideas and help you develop in an active way. And so when I was making decisions about what graduate program I wanted to go to, where I wanted to do my postdoctoral fellowship, what faculty position I wanted, I, I had research questions. And that was, that was important. But the most important thing was, who am I going to be collaborating with? Can I communicate with them? Do they care about my science and me as a person? And I think that that is the biggest thing. And I think the reason I ended up picking Vanderbilt was because it was a bunch of people who actually cared about each other and how, how they were doing. It wasn't you know every person for themselves. It's a group effort to solve these big problems. And that changes the way that you feel about research. What I have done since I started is, is trying to make sure that everybody in my lab has independent funding and has developed an idea that we can work on together that really kind of fosters their creativity and passion for science. And so almost all of my, my lab members are funded on individual grants. 
And so we recently just had um, somebody awarded an F99 K00, which is a fellowship that allows them um, to have four years of independent postdoctoral fellowship uh, funding. Um, we've had other people who are on other training grants as well. Um, and we recently had one of my postdocs got a first author paper looking at the interactions between the immune system and, um, and addiction and how we can use the immune system as a new target for improving treatment outcomes in, in these psychiatric disease states. And so, you know, the thing that gets me excited isn't just, you know, how well I'm doing, it's actually how well they're doing and seeing them develop into independent scientists with their own passions and trying to help them figure out how to maximize their potential so that they can go out into the world and make discoveries on their own. And so the great thing about being in this position is that you can make a difference yourself, but really what is the biggest thing for the community is training large groups of other people to go out and be good, rigorous scientists who are excited about solving these problems and give them the tools to do that. I did my undergraduate at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and I was studying how um, MDMA or ecstasy affects, affected brain development and I started there because I had a professor who I took a class with and he actually reached out to me and said hey you know you should you'd be great at research you should join my lab and that's kind of how it got started and then I got really passionate about drug abuse so I ended up doing my graduate training at Wake Forest School of Medicine in Winston-Salem North Carolina and um, it was a kind of transformative experience for me. It, it connected me with a bunch of really world-class drug abuse researchers that were passionate about these problems, but also my career as a young scientist. And so they really pushed me to think big about you know, the next big question, not just do what other people have done, but think about, okay, what have we not been able to do? How can technology push the boundaries of how we understand information encoding in the brain and its dysregulation by disease. And then I ended up doing my postdoctoral fellowship at Mount Sinai in New York, um, where I kind of had the opportunity to integrate new tools into my repertoire and learn about big data approaches and how we can use multi-dimensional data sets to really understand the brain from the molecular level, the circuit level, the behavioral level. and all of these experiences were really critical to in solidifying my understanding of you know, the problem, how we can approach the problem, and how we can take the information we know and use that to push science forward. And so it's been, you know, Vanderbilt's a great place for me now because the, I get to use all these tools in an environment where there are amazing resources and people to actually do this now in my own lab and I can get you know, the next generation of scientists excited about these problems as well. And so now I have a lab of you know, graduate students and postdocs that I get to help see how exciting science is and help them kind of develop their passion for, you know, addiction work or whatever they get excited about.